check valve. Once you have it, you don't go back. Because it's not based on you. It's based on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not based on your decisions and your behavior or your righteousness. It's based on His. And once you make that commitment and you repent and you believe, it is done, as He said. Today we're opening the book of Psalms. It's a book God's people have used for millennia to worship Him. It's structured into five books based on the Hebrew tradition of the Pentateuch, which is the five books, first books of the Bible written by Moses. It's the largest book in the Bible with the largest chapter, being Psalm 119. And it's composed of five primary poem types. Wisdom, which we'll see today in Psalm 1. Lamentation, penitential, kingship, and thanksgiving. At a macro level, it establishes the structure that we see in the entire Bible. Each psalm provides a guiding structure for us to bring our praise and our concerns to the one true and only living God. Psalm 1 will introduce us to the critical concept that God separates the wicked or the ungodly, based on his judgment, from the righteous, based on how he sees our righteousness, which is very challenging. Paul illustrates this for us in Romans 3, verse 10. No one is righteous. Again, I go back to your salvation, hence our deep and critical need for the Lord Jesus Christ, because he is righteous. Today we'll break Psalm 1 into two parts. We'll do verses 1, 2, and 3, and then verses 4, 5, and 6. Praise the Lord that they're even, right? Balanced. <clears throat> and on... The first three verses, it's, it's a map, a road map, for us to build our relationship with the Lord, the blessings that come when we walk in His will, and how to do that. And the second part, in verses 4, 5, and 6, very painfully illustrate the consequences when we choose to be our own God. Although it's most likely titled in your Bible as the righteous and the wicked contrasted, I would advocate that Psalm 1 is actually the blueprint for our relationship with God. And the blessings that are available to us when we apply it. The vital one being our everlasting relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the ultimate consequence, which is eternal damnation. With this in mind, I advocate the sermon title for today is Our Relationship with God. What is in your heart? Please open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, chapter 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. 
Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So let's jump into verse 1. What do we see here in verse 1? We see not taking the counsel of the wicked. We see not walking hand in hand with sinners down the path. And as Christians, we see something that is completely foreign to us that we can't even conceive of doing. We see mocking of God or sitting in the seat of scoffers. Something that definitely builds a wall between us and the Lord. One thing that I think is super cool about God's Word is that it constantly and consistently illustrates and explains the concepts that it contains. We'll look at two illustrations. Luke 15, 11 through 32, and Exodus, chapter 7 through 12. So let's start with Luke 15, 11 through 32. This chronicles the story of the prodigal son. So this young man decided to do what was right in his own eyes, to be his own God, to defy what God had established inside of Jewish culture. And he came to his dad and he said, Hey, I would rather we pretend you're dead. So that I can take all these resources that I don't want to wait for and run around and have a good time. So what does he do? Takes the counsel of the wicked. Walks down the path of the sinner. Ultimately scoffing at God. And where does he end up? Literally in a pig pen. Bankrupt financially, morally, ethically, and spiritually. But just like we see here in Psalm 1, there's a capacity for restoration. So we see him go against the template that God has set out, come to that realization, repent, and come back and be restored which is exactly our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He provides that for us. Another example we find in Exodus chapter 7 through 12, this is where Moses has come. The Lord has decided it's time for the Hebrew people to be set free from the slavery that they have been oppressed with for over 400 years in Egypt. And who's holding them hostage but Pharaoh. And in these chapters... Multiple times, either of his own accord or God's accord, but Pharaoh hardens his heart. And he deceitfully deals with the, Egypt, with the Hebrews to get outside of God's punishment, God's pestilence. Simply put, maybe a lot longer for some of us than others, but... When you were out on the playground, 10 years old, and you focused on your desire, what you wanted, the swing, the toy, the ball, the monkey bars, whatever it was, you were more than likely willing, and I only say this from experience, to do whatever it took to get that with no intent just like Pharaoh, to make good on the promises that you would come forth with. Your heart was hardened. My heart was hardened to my own desires, what I wanted. I was my own little God. And I was willing to do whatever it took to meet my needs. 
Let's look at two specific words inside of verse 1. Blessed and counsel. The Hebrew word for blessed is esher. And it means happiness. One of the English definitions for blessed is blissfully happy or contented. I want you to internalize that, right? How blessed, how content, how internally happy, how blissful is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Counsel in Hebrew is eshta and can also be translated advice. The dictionary defines counsel as advice, opinion or instruction given in directing the judgment or conduct of another. We can correlate that God directs that we avoid the advice or influence of the ungodly to receive his blessing. He illustrates this concept in Deuteronomy 3. <clears throat> Just before the Hebrews are to come into the chosen land and possess it, God specifically tells them, you will not intermarry with the indigenous peoples. Because if you do, their pagan influence, their pagan gods, will challenge my place in your heart. And he knows that inside of a marriage, the emotional intimacy will lead them astray. I think more commonly, if we looked at our culture, what we would say is, you become who you hang out with. Okay, let's take a survey. Do you like surveys? I like surveys. I like to see where everybody's at. So raise your hand if you know what exposure therapy is. All right. You know, this is a bigger group in the morning, and, but there was more of them in there that knew what that was. However, I will say that uh, when I gave this to my class at, at the school, there's six guys in there, and none of them had any idea what I was talking about. So at least the four or five of you in here give me hope that, you know, we have some, some exposure to exposure therapy. So what is it? What's exposure therapy? It's a process by which something brings us anxiety or fear or doubt. It could be an item. It could be an event. It could be a person. And we take that and we start exposing ourselves, usually over a controlled period of time. So for example, let's say... Uh, you know, when I was uh, uh, 10, I was afraid to go up on the high diving board, right? So what we did was uh, I went up to the top, and I just stood up there for a minute and then went down. And then we kind of repeated this, you know, over a series of several days until by the time I'd gotten up there and I'd been able to stand up there for 15 or 20 minutes, I was numb to the fear. It didn't bother me anymore. And that's what exposure therapy is all about. And this is where we need to be very cautious. Because that same concept is true when we see a person or a group that we're drawn towards, that we want to establish a relationship with. And in our mind we see, well, they don't believe exactly what I believe and they don't act exactly the way that is biblical, but I'm drawn to them. I'm going to bring light to them. And then, slowly over time, uh, we do just little things. So, for example, maybe it's um, the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. Or, just for gender neutrality, maybe it is the period-specific historical romance. It's, it's not pornography, because we don't do that. Maybe it is profanity. It starts out small, there are softer words, and it just grows. 
But inside that group, over time, there is no accountability for these biblical values, for the foundation that God provides for us. And before we know it, we are walking in the counsel of the wicked. Things are coming out of our mouth that we could never have conceived of. We are doing things that do not conform to what we state we believe. And before we know it, we are mocking God. This example highlights the importance of taking God's counsel and not man's. Even more simply, think about it like this. <clears throat> I go outside, I grab the frog, I come in, I grab the pot, I put some cold water in there. The frog's comfortable in the cold water, doesn't hop out of the pot. But I reach down and I turn on the burner just on low. And several hours later, I'm serving the frog for dinner. And he has no concept because he was numb to the heat. I'd used exposure therapy. And before he knew it, he was cooked. The same situation for us. When we choose to establish relationships with those that live according to what they see as right in their own eyes, their influence upon us can be insidious. It's a cool word, right? Insidious. So slow, unaware. But it can be an insidious hardening of our heart to God's will for us. Okay, let's move into to verse 2. So we look at verse 2. It's going to change our perspective. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. So we've gone from what we shouldn't do in verse 1 to what we should do in verse 2. Two key words, delight and meditate. Delight is commonly defined as a high degree of pleasure or enjoyment, joy, rapture. And meditate to engage in thought, or contemplation, to reflect. So if we're going to delight in something, if we're going to delight in a relationship, if we're going to have a deep relationship, we have to dedicate resources to that relationship. Most of it is time. We've got to spend time. And it's the same with God. How can we assume that this relationship is something we can delight in if we don't spend time in it? We must immerse ourselves in His Word. Again, one of the awesome things about God's Word that I find consistently is it doesn't matter how many times I've read a verse, Bible studied a verse, it's always illuminating. There is always something new in God's Word, regardless of how many times I go through it. How can we delight in His law if we're not engaged in it routinely, like every day? God directs His chosen people to impress these words of mine on your heart and on your soul. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. Deuteronomy 11.18 I would appeal to you that meditating is far more than just being in a quiet place and mentally unpacking the meaning and impact of God's Word. It truly emphasizes that our immersion in God's Word is so encompassing that we evaluate every situation and every experience through the Word of God, through our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You may have heard this commonly referred to as a Christian worldview. 
What does that mean? A Christian worldview. When we're meditating on God's Word, it means that regardless of the situation that you are in, the decision that you have to make, we bring it to the Lord. We pray. We dig into God's Word. We come to God's people. And that's how we proceed forward. One thing I can guarantee you is this. You will easily be able to come up with a specific set of variables that are very intricate that you cannot come into God's Word and find those exact variables. But what I can also guarantee you is that inside of God's Word, the foundation for morality that it provides ensures that there is an answer and a path for every situation that you will have to engage if you decide to make sure that he's part of the process and not rely on your own understanding. Again, let's go to God's Word. Genesis 38.9. What do we see here? This is kind of uh, the midpoint of the story of Joseph. So he's been sold into slavery by his loving brothers. And he's been bought by Potiphar. Joseph is blessed. He is chosen by God. And because of that, Potiphar's household is also blessed and thrives because of the blessing of God through Joseph. And in this piece of scripture, what do we see? We see Joseph's inside. He's taking care of the business he does on a daily basis. And Potiphar's wife has decided she likes what she sees. And so she directly engages Joseph to have an adulterous affair with her. And he relies, even back in Genesis, on his Christian worldview. And what's his response? He says, How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? Because he feels the blessing of God all the time. All right, as we make our transition into verse 3, when we're doing Bible study and we're breaking apart God's Word, we want to be very conscious of what he uses to illustrate his concepts to us. So in verse 1, we had a path and we had seats. There's some imagery there. We talked about delight and meditation, so it kind of builds a contract construct for us about what to do and how to engage him. But in verse 3, we kick up the imagery exponentially. And we're going to focus on two pieces, the tree and the water. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. Let's begin with the tree. So in my New American Standard Bible, it uses the word firmly planted. Firmly is not in there. It's not a Hebrew word. This is part of their interpretation. And they did that specifically to underscore the fact that it's firmly planted. It's intentional. These aren't just seeds blowing around in the wind randomly placed on the ground. This is God intentionally planting a tree. Like he intentionally created us in his image. As we see in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Placed on the earth specifically for his glory. So let's examine deeper the tree what this imagery would mean both to the Hebrews, the desert people, and to us. Because as we commonly see, God's word is timeless. It applied then, it applies now, and it will apply for eternity. So what did the Hebrews see when they saw this tree in the desert? They saw life. They saw water. They saw shelter. They saw respite. They saw a blessing. 
What do we see when we see a tree? Think of the characteristics of a tree. Strong. Well-rooted. Several trees in the United States are thousands of years old. So their longevity is even farther than ours as far as their physical life. The roots penetrate down in and reach out for the streams. So let's talk about the water. The streams of water reinforces God's eternal commitment to always be with us. Never leave us nor forsake us, as we see in Deuteronomy 31, 6 and 8. We also see it in John 4, 10, when Jesus is directly speaking to the woman at the well. And what does he say? You drink of this living water, you will never thirst again. Jesus also emphasizes this for us in John 7, 37 and 38. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And of course, John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So ultimately, the tree may be strong, and it may have the capacity for a long lifespan, but the bottom line is if those roots continue to reach out, and that water doesn't penetrate into them and permeate the tree, it will die. Just like we will not have eternal life without the Lord Jesus Christ. We will die. Jesus talks about fruit in John 15, 5. And that water, as it permeates through the tree, just like Christ permeates through us, goes out into those branches and provides the capacity for fruit to come forth. Now, if you want to get ahead on a future sermon series about the fruit of the Spirit, you can dive into Galatians 5.22. In that, the Apostle Paul recounts the specific fruits of the Spirit. Okay, so let's summarize the first three verses, because we're about to uh, make a bridge into the wasteland, into the definitely the darker part of Psalm 1. Be deliberate and intentional with whom you choose to be influenced by. Do everything you can to immerse yourself in God's word. Read the Bible. Spend time with other Christians studying the Bible. Listen to sermons, not just on Sunday. But the bottom line, just like Peter tells us, be prepared to provide a defense. Feed your relationship with God by prioritizing Him and carving out time for Him. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. So I think we go from something that's fairly sunny and rewarding, delightful, and we shift some major gears. We see the dark clouds coming over the horizon, full of lightning and hail. Let's look at some of the vocabulary. Several of the translations substitute ungodly for wicked. I think that's good from the standpoint that it illustrates to us that it's not of God, it's separated from God, it's away from God. The Hebrew word is rasha. It means bad person, morally wrong, wicked, ungodly. Combined with the meaning of chaff, worthless matter 
or refuse. I don't know about you, but I have no desire to be worthless matter. Because in most cases, God sees that as requiring disposal by fire. It not only removes his blessing that we heard in the first three verses, but it allows curses. Into verse 5. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. More consequences for aligning ourselves with the ungodly. So let's look at the first part of that verse. The wicked will not stand in the judgment. This is not a free pass for the wicked. This means they're going to be there and they will not be erect. They will be judged and they will either be on their knees or they will be prone because they will be judged on their righteousness. As saved, we have the huge privilege of being judged by the Lord Jesus Christ's righteousness, which means we will stand in the judgment. The second half of the verse is also commonly translated as congregation for assembly. Sinners, nor sinners in the assembly, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, nor sinners in the presence of God. God is very consistent throughout Scripture that those who consciously sin will be separated from His people. We see this very, very pointedly in Joshua chapter 7. So Joshua has led them into combat. And again, very similar to Adam and Eve, he has one requirement. I will be there, you will be successful, and you will take nothing. Scripture says it's a ban. Unfortunately, Achan submits to temptation and he violates the ban. And the consequences are catastrophic, not only for him, but his entire family group. He is separated from the chosen people, stoned. We can see it as well in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, here the Apostle Paul is directly addressing the Corinthian church about immorality of members in their church. Church discipline. It's a challenging thing. You want to make sure there's grace, you want to make sure there's the opportunity for repentance and restoration. So, several years ago here at Farm Loop, I was asked to kind of say, hey, let's make sure that our process is biblically solid. So I, I made some phone calls to other churches and to Christian associations and the Christian Law Association. And one of the gentlemen I was speaking to, because um, we talked about each one of these conversations was fairly long because this is a sensitive subject but something that we have to do and he recounted to me he said yeah Tony you know we had a situation we had one of our deacons and it had been identified to us that he was in an adulterous relationship and so he said well we've we've got to get the elders and the pastors together and we need to address this so we called him in in private and we laid out the facts as we had them. And we were hoping that he would engage us, right? And he would acknowledge it. And he would repent. And there, there would be restoration. And that was, that was their intent that he communicated to me. He said, unfortunately, the deacon rationalized his relationship. And he made it very clear there was going to be no changes. 
This is how it was going to be. So they made the logical next step, which was they told him, well, that does not conform to the biblical requirements for being a deacon, and therefore you're going to have to step down. At that point, he recoiled, became aggressive, and told them on no uncertain terms would he relinquish his position. The timing of this probably wasn't the best because it was right prior to their service. So as he left, the church leadership was still wrestling with, okay, what, how are we going to take care of this? They can't just let it lay. And during that process, his primary duty as a deacon was to take the offering. So he, if we use Farm Loop as an example, so he would have been in the back, he would have grabbed the offering plate, and as he made the turn in the back by Dan, he fell flat on his face from a fatal heart attack. When the EMS folks arrived, they pronounced him dead on the scene. And this bridges us into verse 6. Because the bottom line here is, you are never going to sneak one past God. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. I focused on the perish word. I had some challenges with this. It just seemed too soft. That illustration that I just gave you, would it have had as much impact if I would have said, and he turned the corner and he perished? Right? That's kind of what I thought, too, because this is a serious subject that we're addressing here. We're talking about eternal damnation, eternal separation from God. So I looked at the definitions, right, for the word perish. What did I find? The Hebrew word is abad, and it includes to wander away, destroy, be void, have no way to flee. Hang on to that one. Have no way to flee. So you are in a place, and you have no way out. Our English definition included to die or be destroyed through violence. I think if we put those together, that is a much more impactful illustration of perish. A violent death. No escape. The end of the line. So reflecting back, God's sovereignty ensures that he knows all things all the time. Finishing off the imagery in these last two verses, the way of the righteous, the path, where we are, where we walk, where we go, what we think, the way of the wicked. We do not escape from the sovereignty of God. And he provides Psalm 1, which I highly encourage you to memorize, make that commitment. Because it provides this blueprint, regardless of where you're at in your Christian walk, whether you are brand new and you have just taken the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior, or you're a pastor, or you're a missionary, you can always reflect back on how can I build my relationship with the Lord and what would be the consequences if I let it degrade? What's in your heart? Please pray with me. Dear Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to come to be inside of your stable will, knowing that regardless of the adversity that we encounter, the uncertainty that our world thrusts upon us, the attacks, 
of the evil one against us. That you, Lord Jesus, are our respite. You are our rock. You are our salvation. Father, give us the courage to take your word, place it in our heart, that it would grow. And Lord Jesus, that you would emanate from us in all the places that we go. That we would take your gospel into the world and avoid the influences of the world. And I pray these things in your holy and powerful name, Lord Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Thank you, and have a blessed week.